Hello, um, this is Jenny from Hepatitis SA. I'm just going to give you a little bit of hepatitis information. It's not a whole lot, but just to give you some key facts. Um, so basically, when we say the word hepatitis, we that means inflammation of the liver, and that can be caused by alcohol, can be caused by other drugs as well. Uh, there is autoimmune hepatitis, um, but the hepatitis virus is, is, I guess, kind of what World Hepatitis Day is all about. Uh, there are five different types of the hepatitis virus, A, B, C, D, and E with B and C being the most common here in Australia. A lot of people um, are, still remain undiagnosed in Australia. Uh, this is often because many people don't have any symptoms or have very few symptoms. Um, so when people do start to, when people do have symptoms, it's often things that can be put down to other things. So feeling tired, feeling forgetful, having brain fog, um, People can have trouble sleeping. Some people um, can get itchy skin. So they're really subtle type symptoms that don't necessarily point to a hepatitis virus. Um, but over time, if left untreated and unmanaged, um, both hepatitis B and hepatitis C can cause cirrhosis of the liver and can also cause liver cancer as well. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about hepatitis B to start with. Um, it is the most prevalent here in Australia now. Um, so there are more people living with hepatitis B than there are hepatitis C. For hepatitis B, it is a blood-borne virus. So that means that the only way someone, or that means that people can catch hepatitis B through um, uh, if, if someone's hepatitis B positive blood gets into someone else's bloodstream. Um, it's also sexually transmitted as well. And for the majority of people around the world, um, mother to baby is the most common way that chronic hepatitis B is transmitted. So for people who do come into contact with hepatitis B, some people will be able to clear the virus and that will happen in the first six months. So if someone contracts hepatitis B, within that first six months, their body recognises it and fights it off for them. It means they no longer have hepatitis B and they also have immunity, so they can't catch it a second time. If they were to come into contact with it, um, the antibodies would recognise it and, and get rid of it. For the rest of the people, they do go on to have a chronic lifelong infection. Um, so there's no cure at this point, um, but with proper management and care, people can live a long, healthy life, which I will talk about. So with the vaccination for hepatitis B, it's three injections over six months. And for most adults, that will give them lifelong protection. Some people do need additional vaccines before they get the right level of antibody protection. Um, and then there is also a small cohort of people who will never successfully vaccinate for hepatitis B. We're not 100% sure why that happens, um, but it can happen for some people. But for the majority of us, those three vaccines will be enough to protect us, and it is for the rest of our life. So for people who are living with hepatitis B, so they've had this virus for more than six months, um, what is the most important message that we need you to impart to the communities that you're working with or you're a part of is that people living with hepatitis B must be seeing their doctor or other healthcare provider every six months for the rest of their life. That is really, really important. At that six monthly checkups, they're probably going to have a blood test. They might get an ultrasound and we're going to be able to determine what's going on with the virus. And some people may be put onto medication, so tablets, one tablet a day, but not everybody does, um, which can be really confusing for people. But the most important thing is that six monthly monitoring. So if you have people in your communities who are not accessing or are not you know, are living with hepatitis B, but they're not doing that six monthly monitoring, please get them to get in touch with us. We can support them, link them up with our amazing viral hepatitis nurses who will support them and make sure they're in that monitoring so that we can keep them alive and well for a very long time and they will die of something completely unrelated to their hepatitis B. Okay, so we'll talk about hepatitis C, um, which is a different virus. Uh, but it does damage the liver. So that's the commonality between hepatitis B and hepatitis C is that they both damage the liver. 
Um, so for hepatitis C, it's a bloodborne virus only. So there is no risk with any other bodily fluids unless they also contain blood. Um, and a lot of people with hep C as well are undiagnosed, so they don't know they're living with this virus. Hepatitis C can also survive outside the body for up to six weeks. Um, it's a very strong, strong virus. We unfortunately do not have a vaccine for hepatitis C, though. So it is around not sharing anything that may have had someone else's blood on it. Uh, but whilst we don't have a vaccine for hepatitis C, we can cure people of hepatitis C. So it's one or three tablets a day, and it's either eight or 12 weeks in duration, and people will be cured. As long as they're taking the medication every day, they will be cured. It's on Medicare, so it's very affordable. If people don't have a Medicare card, we can often find ways around that. Um, so please get in touch with us. Um, the new treatments, they're really well tolerated, so they have very few side effects. So again, if you know anyone living with Hep C, please tell them about the new treatments. Please tell them to get in touch with us. And again, we can link them up with our amazing viral Hep nurses and they can support them to get onto treatment. So I'll just talk quickly around transmission. So how might someone contract Hep B or Hep C? So when we're talking about blood to blood transmission risk, um, sharing injecting drug equipment is the highest risk in Australia. In um, low income countries or countries where there is war and fragmented healthcare systems, that kind of thing, actually medical procedures is probably a higher risk. Um, all around the world, if people are sharing tattooing or piercing equipment, that's going to be a risk. Uh, and blood transfusions before 1990 in Australia when we were screening for Hep C. Um, we've been screening for Hep B since the late 70s and HIV since the mid 80s. Um, getting blood splashed on your face or in your eyes, nose, mouth is a lower risk, um, but still recommend to rinse those areas thoroughly. And then sharing toothbrushes, razors, anything like that that may contain someone else's blood, we definitely don't want to be doing that. And so then everything that is not associated with that is not a risk. So anything to do with saliva, spitting, coughing, sneezing, et cetera, unless it contains blood, it's not a risk of transmission. Um, casual contact, like sharing food, sharing drinks and cups, that kind of stuff, we don't. It's not a risk of transmission. Coming into contact with sweat, not a risk. Kissing, it's not a risk. And mosquitoes as well do not transmit bloodborne viruses. So in Australia, legally, um, as far as having to tell someone else if you have a bloodborne virus, so if you have Hep B, Hep C or HIV, there's only a few times where people have to do this. One is if people are joining the Australian Defence Force, so the Navy, the Army or the Air Force, people are tested um, and it may affect your application. If people are surgeons or dentists or similar doing um, procedures where they're putting their hands into people's body cavities with sharp objects so they can bleed into the patient, there's very strict rules around that. But as a patient going into a hospital, they do not have to disclose their bloodborne virus status. Some health insurance or life insurance forms may ask if you have a chronic condition and you must answer truthfully to that. Um Donating blood. So if you're going to donate blood here in Australia, um, one of the questions on the form is, have you ever tested positive to Hep B, Hep C or HIV? It is a legal document, so you have to answer truthfully. Um, but if you, know, if you have never been tested, so you don't know, uh, you go donate blood, they still test the blood with every donation. doesn't matter how many times you donate. And um, the final one is like combat type sports. So cage fighting, USC, boxing, they do test those competitors prior to those sports. But outside of those times, someone's bloodborne virus status is their own personal medical information. And it really does need to be kept confidential. So if someone does disclose this information to you, you don't have to tell the rest of the community because it's really hard for these viruses to be spread in that kind of setting. It's really important that we still... Um, uh, we still include people in our community events um, and we don't exclude them. There's a lot of stigma, a lot of shame associated with these viruses. 
Um, so yeah, it's really important that we um, try to reduce that stigma that people might be feeling. Um, yeah, and we don't have to ask people if they have a blood borne virus. So that's it really. I know you can't ask me questions because this is a recording, but my email address is here and Cecilia's email address as well. So if you have any questions going forward, um, please feel free to send us an email or you can give us a call um, as well and we will answer that.